Well, it's time for us to talk sports this morning on The Breakfast, and we have a sports journalist who joins the conversation, Monday Thomas. Thank you so much for being part of The Breakfast. It's always great to hear. Good morning to you, Mercy. It's all right, then. Uh, but let's get it started. You know, we start off with the Falconets. It's been quite impressive. Is that yesterday you had, you know, the Falconets, you know, kicking the Canadians to that uh, win. What are your thoughts, really? It's been quite impressive on this other side, and, and that's what a lot of people are saying. My thoughts is everyone's thoughts. I mean, we're all very excited as Nigerians that uh, Christopher Danjuma, who was uh, the former Super Falcons coach, has been able to do greatly with the Falcon at uh, the currently ongoing 10th FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup, currently ongoing in uh, Costa Rica. I mean, out of uh, three games... Three wins, top of the group, five goals scored. And, of course, that goes to show that uh, Christopher Danjuma is doing a great job with the ladies. And I'm also going to give credits to the ladies who have uh, taken instructions, the ladies who have uh, been able to execute the plans of uh, Christopher Danjuma. Well, it's the name on my lips this morning because I think he's a prolific manager. And uh, I'm looking at him taking over the job of the Super Falcons in years' time. I know that uh, the Super Falcons are preparing for the upcoming uh, FIFA on uh, FIFA Women's World Cup that will be played in Australia and New Zealand. But all we have now is the under-20 who are certainly flagging, uh, flying the flag of the uh, of that Nigeria. And they are, of course, they're doing it in the best possible way. Uh, they take on Netherlands. Uh, it should be a very dicey fixture for me in the quarterfinals, which is going to be played on the 21st of this month. And I think if they can get past the Netherlands, then... I th uh, the, the Falconets can win the trophy because if we beat the Netherlands, we get to play uh, Mexico or Spain in the semifinals. In my opinion, if we can get past France in the first game, you know what we did to the Canadian ladies, beating them three goals to one. And of course, uh, uh, that uh, win against the South Korean in the second game, we we've been fantastic. And I think for me, we just need one win. With a win against the Netherlands, who are also a high-scoring side, by the way, in case you don't know, the, the Netherlands scored four goals past Ghana in their last group games. So, playing the Netherlands, who have scored seven goals in, uh, as we compare them to the Falcons, who have scored five goals. So, I think it's going to be a top game in the quarterfinals for us. Uh, but uh, looking at the semifinals picture, which is going to be either uh, Spain or Mexico, I think it's going to be easy one if we can get past the Netherlands. For me, the Netherlands are a very tough tax for us. It's going to be an obvious one, and we need to get past them if we are in need of the trophy. It's going to be the first time Nigeria will win the trophy if they do so. But it's not going to be the first time for us uh, making it into the finals. We've done that in the 2010 and also in the 2014 where we lost to Germany. So we, we've been finalists before, and I see us becoming finalists again. And hopefully we get to clinch it this time. So ahead of the games that we have, I mean, what would you see... Uh, should be corrected. What, what are the areas? I'm sure that you have followed the game all through. We have recorded great uh, victory against every other side that we have played. And moving forward to the next level, what do you think that we need to work on, probably sit up and improve? All right. First of all, we know sports football in general is a game of uncertainties. Uh, the third game that we play, we didn't get to have our, our heat woman. I, I tend to call her hit woman because she was the one getting the goals for us in the uh, qualifiers. I'm talking about Sebastian Flourish, who lifted up this competition for us, scoring the first goal against... Uh, what game did we play in the first game? Against France, yes, scoring the first goal against France. And then that's how the goals started coming in. She did not feature in the last game. And that's why uh, Esther Oyezi Day, of course, has scored two penalties in that... Uh, 3-1 uh, victory against Canada. We just need our team to be fit. We just need to pray to God that everyone is fit at all departments. We need uh, fitness, first off, before we talk of executing the plan. Because so far, the, the, the ladies have been good at uh, making sure whatever the coaches tell them on paper, they are ready to put them to work. So the ladies, I mean, uh, in that game against Canada, uh, where they were going down by goal, they, they went down by goal, and uh, come back to, of course, win. That, that, goes, that goes to show that uh, they've got some champions' abilities. I mean, it's not, it doesn't really matter how you go down, but how you come back is what really matters. And the ladies all around have been superb. But when you talk about uh, what they need to do, they just need to be more clinical. Yes, they should be more compact in the midfield because, you know, football, a game anytime, any day is one in the midfield. And we've got Mercy Ikodu, we've got 
Sebastian Flores, and I've got, we've got the highest goal scorer for Nigeria in this tournament so far, Esther Oyez today with uh, three goals so far. So we just need to be fit. We just need to be compact in the midfield. And of course, very clinical when we have chances. Okay, uh, away from the Falcons, let's also look at the English Premier League. Uh, coming to it, before we talk about match day three quickly, let's look at what's been going on. I mean, for the likes of Man United, uh, it seemed like, and Liverpool, uh, struggling for the position of relegation. What do you make of this? This is compared to every other season. It feels quite different, you know, for some of these uh, clubs that have been described as one of the best. I mean, football can be very, very different and shocking and surprising. No one would ever think that Man United would be on 20 and you also have Liverpool uh, struggling to get back there to relegation. But your thoughts, uh, Monday? I mean, the season is uh, just starting. I mean, Arsenal started the season as uh, very poor last season, but they were able to make it to the top six. I mean, Arsenal lost three games last season and are losing to the likes of Brentford, Manchester City and Chelsea. So we've seen this happen before. For Manchester United, this is not the first time they've lost two games in a row at the start of a Premier League season. You know, I love numbers. I love stats. Remember last week, I told you Mo Salah's never scored in match day two. He did not score. I told you, Gerald Jesus loved playing against Leicester City, and he scored twice. So, numbers, the game is a football where history repeats itself. Way back in 1992, uh, when the Premier League got started, Manchester United lost two games at the start of that season. And guess what, Mercy? They went ahead to win the title. <laughs> so, for Manchester United fans, I'm not coming to massage your shoulders. I'm not coming to tell you things will be fine. But things will be fine if you do the right things, if you get the right signings. But... We've seen for the past five years, Manchester United have spent over billions uh, to get the right players since uh, Alex Ferguson retired. They've been struggling to get the right kind of players. They will go for commercial buying. They'll go for Paul Pogba. For me, I think it was a commercial player. Likes of Cristiano Ronaldo. Fantastic. He scored goals for Manchester United in his second stint. But I think it was a commercial buying. Manchester United keeps getting richer and richer. But, but the results on pitch of play, which is what will make the fans happy, uh, we are not seeing it. So Manchester United maybe are becoming a commercial club. Now I'm adding maybe because I have my own opinions to that. I can, of course, uh, uh, back that particular opinion. They're becoming a commercial club, uh, unlike the result-oriented club we, we knew them for. When it comes to football, for you to get the results, it's about winning games, it's about winning trophies. But in the past five years, Manchester United can only boast of a Europa Cup uh, that they won with Jose Mourinho. But, but for Liverpool, it's too early. Liverpool, world-class team, still unbeaten. They're still unbeaten, although they're in a relegation battle right now. <laughs> they're still unbeaten in the season. <laughs> but it's too early to talk relegation right now. But I know for the troll, for the violence. <laughs> no, 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 we can no, mention man. The <laughs> No, I totally understand that you're trying to be very... You're trying to sound like a gentleman this morning on air, bro. I mean, this are, this are the real stuff we're looking at. It's, it's the stats that we're looking at here. If you look at the table now, Man United is 20 on the table, and that's relegation already. I mean, I really don't know how these things can be. <laughs> you tell me. Liverpool is 12. I love Liverpool so much, and you know already. But it's really saddening. 12. No, this, no, are, no. This, this is the reality, man. And so well, I, I think that we have to call it... We have to look at what it is now. But what do you think might just be wrong with some of these top clubs that have been performing over the years? Could it be that, you know, the transfer window has affected them negatively? It, it, I mean, for instance, the likes of, uh, you know, Liverpool, you know that there's a money. Uh, over the last match that was played, a lot of people talked about the fact that, oh, you know, there's no money, there's no money to perform the magic. And really, could it be that the transfer window has affected? Now, that's for the Liverpool. But on the other side, on Manchester United or Man United, could it also be that the fact that they've not been able to get, you know, uh, you probably just buy over uh, a player, a certain player that would solve the problem, is really why they are where they are today? Well, for Manchester United, I, I told you they, they, we, they go for commercial buying. And right now, they are trying to get players. I mean, the transfer market is just days away. And the 1st of September, to be the end of the transfer, or the summer transfer window in European football. And, and it's quite a shame that now Manchester United are not going to get the right signings, for me. Because it is just days away. What are they are doing right now, they're just getting desperate signings. They're just, okay, let me just... Because for the past three three trials now, 
they've been able, they've not been able to seal a deal with Frankie Dion. They're trying getting Anthony from Ajax. He's saying, I'm not going to join Manchester United. Imagine a player from Ajax Amsterdam who, before now, will think Manchester United is a club that will put him on, on the limelight. But for Manchester United, for Ajax Amsterdam to Manchester, he's saying that this is not a good deal for me. Anthony has rejected Manchester, but according to reports this morning, Manchester United are close to getting the signing of Casimiro. Casimiro is 30 years of age. He's won trophies. He has won everything there is in, in, in European football. Now he's just coming to Manchester United probably to just cash out. He's just coming to, for Manchester, to Manchester United for maybe the pension for the end of the year because according to reports, he's going to sign a four-year deal. So Manchester United, for the past three seasons now, they've not been getting their transfer right. I think the chief scouts should be indicted with this. Their transfer decisions has been appalling. And for Liverpool, at the start of the season, Sadio Mane is gone. They, they should let bygones be bygones. The young man is doing pretty well with uh, Bayern Munich, and so is Luis Diaz. Did you see the goal he scored against Crystal Palace? A world year and a half. So Luis Diaz is going to certainly replace Sadio Mane in no time. Liverpool, for me, are still at top side. It's just match day two. We've got 36 more games to go. And better watch out on Monday. Monday, which is next week, where Liverpool will take on Manchester United at the Old Trafford. So I know I know you're smiling already, but I'm, I'm going to tell you what you would like. I think no. that game is going to end a draw. <laughs> <laughs> Mama, let's talk about match day three proper now. You have talked about one of the games that will be anticipated, Man United and Liverpool right there. Uh, but, but apart from that game, there are other games. What should we look at? Tottenham is not doing badly this season. I mean, you can also look at the table. Uh, they are very, very close, you know, to the top. What are your thoughts, really? Yeah, let's, let's talk about teams that people are not really highlighting them to be uh, the top guns for this season. The likes of Tottenham Hotspur, who have who are beaten so far, a draw at the uh, Stamford Bridge in that very feisty London derby, a 4 0 win against Southampton at the Tottenham Stadium in that first game. So, Tottenham Hotspur, for me, they've been brilliant. Apart from what they did in the transfer market this summer, they've also, they also have a fantastic manager. Antonio Conte is a serial winner. If you saw that battle at the Stamford Bridge, it was not just a battle on the pitch of play. It was a battle on the dugout. It was a battle of the fans. I mean, Tottenham Hotspur know that they've assumed in so much in this team. And, of course, they expect a lot from them. And Antonio Conte is certainly their man. So, for this season, it could be surprising that the most improbable thing will be Tottenham Hotspur winning the title. And I'm also going for them. For Manchester City, they are trying to make uh, Erling Haaland jail to the team. And uh, Pep Guardiola came out to say after that, uh, uh, after the second game where Manchester City were 40 winners against uh, Bournemouth, surprisingly, Erling Haaland was not on the score sheet. And Pep Guardiola is coming out to defend a young man and saying, hey, he needs time. He needs time. He's going to jail. He just needs to understand the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gameplay of Ikai Wunderwan and uh, Kevin De Bruyne, who are the most creative players in Manchester City. He being just understands the, the style of these two players, that Erling Haaland will be magical. So the talks of people saying that Erling Haaland will flop, I'm not going to go with that opinion. The talks of people saying Liverpool who are still missing money, I'm not going to go with that opinion because Luis Diaz is a world-class player. Uh, Darwin Nunes did not have the, fun, the finest of... Uh, home debut, but he's going to grow into the Premier League. We just need to cut them some slack. Luis Diaz, for me, I'll go back to Luis Diaz. He's a player that will certainly live up to the feeling. And now let's come to Arsenal as we're heading to match day three. They'll be playing uh, Burnley, uh, not Burnley, uh, AFC Bournemouth, right there at the Vitality Stadium. And uh, it's, it's the man on fire, Gabriel Jesus, who's been banging in goals left right centre for uh, Arsenal. Two goals in two. And of course, he has provided two assists. Uh, the young man is prolific, and also Arsenal could, would be a team that would go for the title. But when it comes to the title, I don't think they can win it this season. Maybe next season. But for this season, I think top four is sure for the Gunners. So what happens with Man City and Newcastle right there? Because Man City is again, I mean, you probably might say it's too early to begin to look at the tables. But of course, Man City yeah, is on top it, of that it, table. It is, it is and Newcastle. Early. <laughs> but, but let's talk it, it about them. Early. I mean, Man City has been fantastic in the previous season. And they're not even taking the back seat, even in the season. And so what do you make of match day three for them with Newcastle? Not also, match you know, day three, they travel to the... Okay, match day three, they travel to the 
St. James's Stadium, and it's quite surprising that Newcastle, we were expecting them to break the bank, we were expecting them to do some ridiculous signings, I mean, some great money moves, but they just laid low because they have one of the finest managers in English football, Eddie Howe. I mean, this man was able to revamp the squad when uh, the, the billionaires came in. In case you don't know, uh, Newcastle are the priciest team in the world. They've got the, lots of money. They have more money than uh, Manchester City. So, but they've not really spent it because they want to build, which is brilliant. All like Manchester United who have this money and they are ready to splash it anytime. But Newcastle, they've got this cash and they want to build. So that game would be very dicey. I think I think it will be. Could be a possible banana slip. We could see Manchester, Manchester City dropping points at the St. James' Stadium because this side, they've got the motivation needed. They've got a world-class manager and they are playing pretty well. Their first game was a win against Nottingham Forest. Their second game, uh, a draw against Brighton. And they're still unbeaten as, Liber as uh, uh, Manchester City. So it's going to be a very good game to watch. So match day three also holds a cracking fixture uh, for uh, Premier League lovers. But for me, my highlight is going to be on Monday where Liverpool travel to the Old Trafford. Remember, Mercy, last fixture, Liverpool scored nine goals. I'm not trying to make you happy, but Liverpool scored nine <laughs> Maybe goals. Maybe you're trying Manchester to make United. me happy. I don't know how many they all score. Uh, when they... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how many goals they will score, but take my predictions. Take my predictions. It's gonna be a win or draw for Ma for, for Manchester United. A but win or draw for Manchester. But it doesn't. It, I mean, it doesn't add up. You know, it doesn't really push them off the table. That's the, that's the point. So it's, <laughs> it, it's a struggle going back relegation. You're just just going back. You know, <laughs> to join the likes of Man Man United. But that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Monday Thomas, for being part of the show. I mean, it's always very fun to. Uh, talk spots with you. All right. So you need some numbers, some numbers as I dropped the last time. Do you need some stats as well? <laughs> Go ahead. All right. I'm just gonna stick. I'm, not, I'm just gonna stick with prediction. I think Arsenal will beat AC Bournemouth by uh, three goals plus, and uh, Manchester City are going to struggle against Newcastle. Maybe a two-one draw or Manchester win by two-one. And then the big one for me is Manchester and Liverpool to draw. Yeah. I'm sorry, then. Well, thank you so much uh, for being part of the show. Monday, we appreciate you as a sports journalist. And we've been talking about match day three as, as well as, you know, the performance of uh, uh, the Falconets so far in the, the Under-20 World Cup. We appreciate you, uh, Monday. Thank you so much. And we look forward to sharing your thoughts next week, Friday. All right. It's always great to be here. Mercy. My regards to battles. And that's the size of the breakfast. If you missed that on any part of the conversation, it would be okay to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and do subscribe to YouTube channel with Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. I am Messi Book. We'll have a fantastic Friday.